Hi, welcome back to McClatchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClatchy and today's video is all about statistics. How do you decide how big a sample should be and what is the difference between a population and a sample? Now this is content that goes right across your curriculum, but it is also something that's very useful if you're writing a mathematical report, whether that's in high school or at university. So firstly in this video, I just wanted to tell you how you can engage further with McClutchy Maths. Firstly, you could follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can also like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll know when the next video on this channel is available to watch. You could also consider saying thanks to us here at McClatchy Mass. There's a couple of ways you could do that. Firstly, you could do that in the comments. Um, you could just tell us that you found the video helpful. I love to hear your feedback. Another way you can do that is to donate back to the channel $2 by clicking on the little love heart button called thanks. You can use your PayPal account there just to help us out with the costs of putting these videos together for you. Okay, let's get right into our content today. What we're going to be covering is firstly a definition of what a population is. We're going to talk about the difference between a population and a sample, how to choose a sample size if you know your population, and I'm going to give some worked examples as well. Let's get right into that. Firstly, what is a population? Now most of us know what the population of a country is. So we'd know the population of Australia, for example, is about 28 million people, or the population of the UK is a lot more people than that. But when we're considering data sets or a group of variables, a population is the whole group from which the data has been collected and it's not the same as the number of people in a country. So most of us think of population in terms of people, but we can also have smaller groups of populations like the population of a town or even smaller groups than that. So for example, we could have a koala population in a particular suburb of Alexandra Hills. We could have all cars listed on a car sales website. That's the population of cars available for sale. It's not the population of all cars in a country, but just the cars on that website that are available. We might consider every item that's for sale in a grocery store as a population of all items in that store. Or if we were at a high school setting, maybe the population would be all the staff teaching or a separate population in that school might be all the students of the school. Or even smaller again, it might be just the students of grade seven. We could have a particular rotary club, all of the members there, that's your population. Every car that's driving on a particular road in a given month, that's the population of cars that drove on that road. I think you're getting the idea. Every temperature recorded in Townsville in the last year is a population of temperatures in Townsville. So yes, they are smaller subsets, but we're looking at a keyword here being all and every. Um, if I had a ward in a hospital, maybe every blood pressure reading for that patient that stood there for, stayed in the hospital for a week, that's the population of the, the particular statistical study that we're doing. So I think you're getting the idea, all and every are our key words. Now, here's why we need to take samples, especially when we've got situations with a very large population, it's not practical to collect the data required for a whole group. We want simply a snapshot of all of the information. So sometimes there's situations where there's lots and lots and lots of information, it's too much for us to sort through. So for example, if I was doing a study on the weights of 50 year old men, it wouldn't be practical for me to take my set of scales and go out to every 50 year old man in the whole country. First of all, it'd be hard to find them all, but it'd be hard to get them all to agree to have their weight taken as well. So that's not a practical study. It'd be time consuming, it'd be costly and difficult. So in situations like that, we don't wanna take the whole population, we wanna take a sample of that population. So that smaller portion of the larger group would be called the sample. So a sample to be a good sample or an effective sample needs to be a good representation of the overall population. So if I was interested in, for example, finding um, the uh, medical conditions of all koalas um, in Australia, it wouldn't be practical for me to go and find every koala, but it might be practical if I took a couple from one state and a couple from another state and a few from another state and then collated that smaller group of data to then get a good picture of koalas right across the country. So there are two things we need to consider when we want a sample to be representative of the overall population. One is going to be sample size. We need a sample size that's big enough to capture all of the information for the population that we're studying. And our sampling method needs to make sure that we're giving a fair representation of the overall group. We're going to cover that in a later video. 
So sample size is going to be influenced by a number of factors. Now the magic question is how big should my sample be? So whether you're doing a scientific study in a lab or a government study of some kind or whether you're just a student in high school that's doing an assignment, then the size of your sample is going to be affected by a range of things. Firstly, What's the purpose of your investigation? If the purpose of your investigation is to introduce a new life-saving drug, then that's gonna make you want to have a bigger sample size because there are things at stake. There are risks involved. People's health and lives are at stake. Large amounts of money are being used to create this study. So we wanna make sure that we've got a good representation of the whole country or the whole world, if that was the case. Also, we need to consider the size of our original population. The mathematical formulas I'm gonna show you today to develop the size of your sample or work out how big the sample should be all depend on you knowing how big the population is to start with. So if you've got a massive population to deal with, such as the population of Earth, then that is going to influence how big your sample size is going to be. Also, we need to have a think about what risks are there of selecting a sample that is not representative. Now, what I mean by that is, if I went and chose a sample size that was so small, um, say I just picked 10 people at random and I did a medical trial with those people, those 10 people are probably not going to be representative or a good reflection of the people that are going to be using this drug or medicine down in the future. And there's great risks attached to that. If I only do a study with 10 people, I might miss people that have adverse reactions to medications. I might miss people who have interactions of medications together. And then I might end up killing people with my future medications. So it's important to make sure the people I choose in my sample are representative of the bigger group. So we've just talked about that medication. There is a lot at risk and the stakes are high when people's lives and health are at risk. So we need to be able to draw accurate conclusions from any study that we do. So in situations like that where the medication is involved, we want to have a decent sized sample. Um, if I was instead exploring people's idea about a new ice cream, do you like this new ice cream flavor? Um, that should also be, you might think, well, no one's going to die by saying they prefer strawberry to chocolate. However, if I was a company planning on spending millions of dollars to launch this new product, I'd want to make sure before I go and invest those million dollars in getting that product to market, that I've got a big enough range of people's opinions about that product to make a good decision. Otherwise, if I only ask five people, do you like my ice cream? And those or people all say yes, but it's not representative of everybody else that's gonna be seeing this ice cream, then what's gonna end up happening is your product will be a flop and you've wasted all that money launching it. So businesses usually want to make sure their sample size is a decent size. On the other hand, a high school assignment exploring the relationship between two things like arm length and height, they need a sample size big enough to draw conclusions, but it also needs to be something that's practical for them to work with. So students who are maybe on a two week deadline to turn around an assignment, don't have time to go and do a survey of 400 people. And at the end of the day, if they, if they don't have a sample size that's representative of the whole world, it's not gonna be a big deal because it's an assignment. The only thing that's really at risk is your grade. So in that case, you need to have a sample size that's practical to deal with, practical to graph on, and also enables you to get the work done on time. So this is where if you are in high school or university, really seek the advice of your tutors and your teachers to make sure that your sample size is appropriate for the kind of study you're doing. Okay, the other thing to consider is the size of the original population. Now, if you're studying a very small population, for example, it might be everybody in your class, then in that situation where you've only talking about maybe 25 to 30 people, that would be appropriate to actually possibly select the whole class and use the whole population. Or if, for example, you were wanting to explore what a daycare center needed and you've only got 32 children attending your daycare center, you'd probably wanna survey all the parents of those 32 people because that will give you a really good representation of what the, the customers of your business are thinking and feeling. Um, so the problem with usually having small samples is that there's a risk that you're not gonna adequately um, reflect the needs of everybody in that whole population. In situations like that where that's a problem, you definitely wanna make sure you have a larger sample. So this is our third point, what is the risk involved? 
Okay, I'm going to take you through some mathematical methods now to work out what your sample size should be. Now, in these situations, you need to know how big your population is. And there are different methods, methods to use for different situations. These are the best methods you can use when you've got low risks, low stakes. So this is typically your high school assignments and university assignments. So there's one um, called 10% of the population. Now, I've given a quote here of where I've sourced that information. It's off a valid source from the internet. There are other valid sources you may choose to use as a source. So if you're writing an assi assignment or a report, you should definitely put a source of where you got this method from. Now in this case, this method has a limitation. There should not have a sample size that's greater than a thousand. So 10% of the population, 10% of 10,000 would be your population. So situations like that, if you've got a population of more than 10,000, this is not the method for you. So let's look at how we would um, calculate that with a worked example. So it's estimated that there's 250 jaguars left in the wild in Argentina. A zoologist wanted to sample the weights of the population using the 10% rule. How many jaguars should the zoologist, zoologist capture and weigh? Obviously it's not practical or possibly very safe to go and capture all 250 Jaguars, they're probably also in the jungle. So he's going to go and look for 10% of them. So the first thing to do, the green words here is the working you would show in a mathematical report or assignment. Firstly, state how big your population is. It's 250. Now, if you don't know that um, population off the top of your head, it'd be a very good idea to put a source here to justify where you got the number 250 from. The next thing, is you're going to put a formula in. Sample size equals 10 over 100. That's a fractional way of saying 10%. This is what we're gonna actually plug into our calculator. 10 divided by 100, 10% times the population of 250. And we get an answer, sample size is equal to 25 Jaguars. So the zoologist has only got to find and capture 25 and weigh them. There are also some different methods that you could use to capture a sample size that's appropriate. Also, good methods to use when you've got low risks, low financials involved. This one's called the square root of n plus one, where n is equal to our population. Once again, I've given a source here from a valid um, website on statistics. So this is also another valid sampling size method. Here I'm going to show you how to apply this one. Max is writing an assignment which explores the ages of professional tennis players versus their net worth. Max wants to select an appropriate sample size using this method, the square root of population. What size should the sample be? So first of all, he's going to find out the population of professional tennis players in the world. It's 3,873 players. And I've used a valid internet statistics website to source where I got that population number from. The next thing I need to do is work out the square root of this population n. When I get the square root, I'm going to add 1 to it. So the square root of 3,873 plus 1 is equal to 62.23 plus 1, which is 63 tennis players rounded. Now, that's a fairly decent number of tennis players for Max to use in his assignment. It's possibly a little bit of a large um, sample size if he's got to do uh, measurements of any kind. It could be a little bit unwieldy. He may wish to round that to the nearest 50, which would mean he'd be rounding that down to a sample of 50, and that might be more manageable. Now, if you decide to round down to the nearest 10 or the nearest 50, so the nearest 10 would be rounding to 60 tennis players in his sample, or the nearest 50 would be 50 in his sample, then in that particular situation, you should make some sort of a note there of how you've rounded that and why you chose that rounding method. Okay, our final mathematical approach we're going to look at today is something called Sloven's formula. It's something that's typically used at a university level and above. And it looks a little bit scary, but I'm going to talk you through what these variables are. Now, firstly, we've got this little n, that's our sample size. That's what we're trying to work out. And we've used this variable in our previous method. It's capital N for population. We've also got this something here, little e. E stands for a desired margin of error. Now, if you're doing an assignment, then you can be comfortable with a much bigger margin of error. If you're doing a study, like a health study or a um, 
something you're going to launch a product you probably want a much lower margin of error so margins of error are calculated as decimal numbers so they're between zero and one so a large margin of error might be for example 50 percent um, so that would be a 0.5. A low margin of error might be 5%. That would be 0.05. You've got to work out what the appropriate margin of error is. And I would say that as you're doing this, if you're going to use Sloven's formula in an assignment, write the formula first, give a source as to where you got it from. Number two, state your variables. You're going to be stating your population size, stating your desired margin forever, and give a justification for those. So here's our example. The population of students at a school was 3,500. A teacher wanted to survey an appropriate sample size with a margin for error of 10%. Calculate the sample size using Sloven's formula. So here's my formula and I've stated my variables. Capital N is the population of 3,500 and my margin for error is 10% or 0.1. So now we're going to substitute that into the formula. So you can see where this information has gone. Population goes here and here and notice that We've got to use our order of operations. There's a number next to brackets here, which means brackets means time. So that's why I've got this time symbol from. And using our bid mass or bomb das or whatever method you use with your teacher, we do the timesing part first. So I do my powers first, 0 0.1 squared, and times that by 3,500, and then add one at the end. And what I get is 36. 3,500 divided by 36 is a sample of 97 students. Now that's a fairly decent size sample. It's a pretty big sample. If I say to myself, that's too many for me to sample, I don't want to sample that many people, what I do is I increase the margin for error. So in that case, what that's going to do, as I increase this margin for error, the sample size will get smaller. Um, if I might say, if this was a survey that I needed to do for a health study, I might say 97 is not enough, in which case I'm going to reduce my error size. I might go from 10% to 1%, for example. So generally speaking, for a low stakes situation like a high school assignment or a university assignment, a sample size of 20 to 50 is pretty manageable. Below 20, you're not really looking at something that's representative of your population. Above 50 can be difficult to hand graph, can be difficult to collect that data under a very short timeline. So that's a rough guide to what you're looking for. And then you just need to find this, the method that's actually going to support something in that range. So here's the assignment part of this um, talk today. What are the implications for your assignment? Firstly, pick one of the three methods. Give a reason for your choice in your assignment. That reason could be a source. Make sure it's a reputable one to justify your decision. Secondly, show all your working as I did. I started with the population, showed the mathematical working, received an answer. Consider the strengths and limitations of that decision. Now, if you're in Queensland, Australia, you're writing a problem solving modeling task and you would be putting steps one and two up in your consideration section of your assignment, possibly in your formulate section of your assignment where you do the procedure. Now you want to talk about this again, because as you are evaluating your decision, you made a decision about a sample size. It's a good idea to evaluate that later in the assignment. So it can lead to strengths and limitations. For example, if you've got an adequate sample size that's representative of the overall population, that's a strength because it makes any predictions you make based on that sample more reliable and it makes your decisions more reasonable. Now, on the reverse of that, if you've got a sample size that's too small and you don't think that's actually going to be representative of your population, then that's going to make your predictions unreliable and unreasonable or less reliable and less reasonable. So big enough sample, it's a strength. Too small a sample, it's a limitation. Now just be careful that you don't say it's both. Now one of the things you could, you could do early on in a maths assignment is make the assumption that your sample size is going to be representative. So there's a very good assumption there. And that's when you evaluate that assumption later on and say, was that reasonable? Possibly not. Um, it's probably a limitation if you've only got a sample of 20 when your population is 2,000. Well, that's all we have time for in today's video. I hope you found this a really helpful resource for writing future assignments or preparing for future exams, no matter where you are in the world. If you've got any questions about one of the methods you saw in today's video, you can contact me at mcclutchymass at yahoo.com. My name is Natalie McClutchy. Have a wonderful day.